Thank you everybody for coming. It's good to see familiar faces as well as some new ones, both colleagues, friends, family as well, in the front row. Um, and special thanks in particular to Janet Tyus and to Seb Zenner, who have been behind all the organization of this and have been in touch with me um, over several weeks. So yeah, thank you to everybody. Um, now I haven't been to an inaugural lecture in quite a while, quite some years. Um, so initially, given that it's pitched at quite different kinds of audiences at the same time, I wasn't really quite sure how to pitch it. So I went back to thinking about how I got into anthropology in the first place, which I'm going to talk about a bit, a bit later, um, and to consider how, if at all, I might try to tie together the quite messy threads of an academic career based initially on fieldwork in India, um, first off with people affected by leprosy in a leprosy colony um, in a very rural area, then on disability more generally, um, which was, was work I also did in Hyderabad, so in an urban environment. Um, then I shifted on to suicide and self-harm. And in recent years, I've shifted into looking at food and foodways. And it seemed to me in thinking about it all that food, although I wasn't always aware of it at the time, in some ways runs through all of it. Um, and certainly when I went back to the notes that I've made over years of field work in India, um, my field notes, stuff about food, right from sourcing it and buying it to preparation and eating to what people had to say about it, is something that appears more frequently than any other single topic. So it's food and its significance that I'm going to focus on for the second half of this talk. I think, yeah, there's some food on the slide behind me, including things I've eaten and a feast that I'd, I'd attended. I think this particular feast was to celebrate the birth of, of somebody of a family that I knew in the village where I did field work. So it's food that I'm going to focus on for the second part of this talk. But before I get to that, I'm going to go back a bit further and say something about how I got into anthropology in the first place. Now, it's true to say, I think, although it probably sounds a bit corny, um, that anthropology was the subject that I wanted to study long before I ever knew that it, it existed. Now, initially, when I was entering the sixth form in the early, 19, well, early, early 1980s, I guess it was, I was drawn to this subject called sociology, which at the time was being introduced into my school as this newfangled additional O-level, what you'd now call a GCSE. Um, it seemed to be quite a new thing, certainly for the school that I attended. And I was hopeful that it might provide me with some answers to the questions that were troubling me about why people did things in the peculiar kinds of ways that they did. And in particular, questions that I had about social class, which was something I was quite obsessed by at the time. Um, I came from what my parents described as a working class family, but we lived in a rather affluent middle class area in the Greenbelt in London, and I went to a grammar school. So I came into regular contact with people from backgrounds that were quite different to my own. And I was struck during that time by the differences, some of them quite subtle, between how we lived in my own household and some of the things that went on in the households of my more middle-class school friends. And these weren't just differences in terms of how much money we had, although that was noticeable, um, but some of these things related, for example, to the words that we used to describe things, um, and also to the ways in which they were said, things like accents. Some related to the things that they had in their houses, their furniture, their decoration, the kinds of souvenirs from overseas holidays that indicated how well-traveled they were. Others related to what they did in their houses, you know, the daily newspapers that they read, or the books that they read and displayed on their bookshelves, the things that they watched on television. But even then, what I was most struck by, I think, when I look back on it, were the differences in what different households and different people in those households ate and drank, and more particularly, how they ate and drank those things. Now, parents of some of my 
more middle class friends. This is a stock photo. These aren't any people I actually, actually knew. Um, but some of my more middle class friends, for example, would sometimes drink wine with their evening dinner, or tea, as I think we called it. And they would have coffee rather than a cup of tea at the end of a meal. And certainly they wouldn't drink tea during it or coffee during it. Um, I mean, if there are any fans here of the, the working class northern soap opera Coronation Street, um, uh, this was an issue for a young aspirational Ken Barlow, who's the younger guy, if, if anybody here doesn't know who Ken Barlow is, he's the, the younger man situated there on the, on, on the right of the picture. Um, and in the scene shown here, which was from the very first episode in, I think it was in December 1960, um, and he's come back from college, he's a first generation student, and he's come back from college to dine with his parents, and he's complaining, although he doesn't do it in quite such an explicit way, complaining about what he perceives to be their working class eating habits, which include things like having their bread ready buttered on a plate by their main meal, or having a bottle of ketchup on the table, drinking tea with the meal rather than at the end of it. Um, and there's a sense that he wants to, them, them to change their ways um, to allow them to move up the social ladder. And his father, as you can see from the, 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 the quote there, doesn't take particularly kindly to what he has to say. Now, in those middle-class households that I visited as a young teenager, I noticed that when they ate salads, they served them with mayonnaise, or in some cases, if they were really fancy, with French dressing, whereas we had salad cream. I know this is a very Anglo-centric kind of um, example, but yeah, bear, bear with me. Um, I could go on, but the point was that I knew even then that these were not simply natural differences in preferences or even really about differences in cost or affordability. They were differences, and differences particular perhaps to a time and a place, to the early 1980s, to the southeast of England, that somehow indexed or even brought about changes in status. They said to me that if I wanted to have the nice things that other people seem to have, or to have the kinds of jobs that they had or that their parents had, I also needed to adopt some of those habits, whether that was speaking more like them, whether it was moving more like them, eating the kinds of foods that they ate, and adopting the styles in which they ate them. Now, I couldn't buy a big house. I couldn't start taking overseas holidays, but I could swap salad cream for mayonnaise. And I realize that this is, as I say, quite a particular example. But for me, salad cream and mayonnaise became iconic of social difference. And they also suggested, I think, the symbolic as well as the material values that food might carry. Now, sadly, the kind of sociology that was on that O-level syllabus um, when I came to look at it didn't really look like it was going to help me to answer the kinds of questions that I had. Now, had it included work by the, the French sociologist Pierre Bourdieu, who's pictured here, who in 1979 had written the book that's also pictured here, Distinction, to give it its English title, um, and it was a book which dealt with those very kinds of questions, perhaps I would have taken a slightly different kind of academic path. Unfortunately, however, that book wasn't translated into English until 1984, by which time I'd left school. Um, and, yeah, even then, I, I suspect I wouldn't really have been able to follow it. Now, Karl Marx, on the other hand, I did try to read, um, and to read things that were written about him, and his ideas about class. He certainly had a lot to say about class um, in relation to the shared and opposing economic interests of different classes. But there was nothing, at least on my reading, which fully addressed what it meant, for example, to eat fish fingers for your tea or beans on toast um, on a tray in front of the television um, rather than, say, distinctive courses at a dining table with napkins or why moving your spoon in a particular way, in a particular direction across your soup bowl, could be read as a marker of your social sophistication or otherwise. But these were the things that actually intrigued me, that these kind of mundane micro details. Um, and given that they were things that couldn't be explained only by differences in economic wealth, I was also interested in, in what they meant. Why was this the case? 
Now, it was only when I travelled to India for the first time, which was in the year after I left school, in the 80s, here is a younger me, um, that I first heard of this subject called anthropology. And I travelled to a, a self-run leprosy colony where a school friend's aunt was at that time um, a resident nurse. And I was there to work as a volunteer um, for six months. Now, by chance, one of the other volunteers who had just returned to the UK, um, a friend now called Rachel, who I think is listening in on the live stream, had just returned to, to, to the UK to study something called anthropology. And her descriptions of it piqued my interest. And the more I learned about it, which wasn't a great deal, this was pre-internet, remember, and I was living in a rural leprosy colony, but the more I learned about it, the more I realised that this could be the subject that I've been looking for. The study of people not as large, relatively abstract groups, or in terms of their individual psychologists, the way that psychologists might be prone to look at them, but by hanging out with small groups of them and by observing close up and over time the day-to-day -day details of people's lives. Because it seemed to me that it was by exploring those details that we could come to understand why people did things in the ways that they did and what those things meant to the people who did them. Now, when I finally did get to study anthropology, which was a few years later at SOAS, um, it's already came up in, in, in the int introduction, this was in 1987, um, and to me it felt mind-blowing. Everything that I had assumed to be true about the world, all of my presuppositions, pretty much about everything, um, were suddenly opened up to question. I mean, I can recall sitting at the bar with my classmates in Sarah's basement after our classes, feeling totally shell-shocked. Um, and it was also, although I only really became aware of this in retrospect, also a moment of crisis in the discipline. It was when the very acts of undertaking and writing up fieldwork, this thing that we as anthropologists call ethnography, were being called into question. The writing culture debate, as it was sometimes referred to, and it was immortalised in the title of a book that was edited by two anthropologists, James Clifford and George Marcus, it argued that writing ethnographies was in some way the act of decoding one so-called culture for the consumption of another. And the cultures that were being decoded, by and large, were those of formerly colonised countries, mostly in the global south. And the consumers of those cultures were those of us from countries that had until recently colonised them. So there was a question whether we, as anthropologists, were we creating culture through our texts? And were we, in doing so, taking away the agency of people in those countries, taking away the agency of people in the global south, to represent themselves? And these are questions, of course, which are still being asked, and they're quite similar in many ways um, to those that are currently being asked in the, in the current move to decolonize scholarship. Um, and they're questions that go across the humanities and social sciences. And all of this was destabilizing, certainly, and it wasn't comfortable either, and there were tensions that one had to learn to live with, but it was also awesome. And I still relive those moments vicariously, those moments of the rug being pulled from beneath your feet and suddenly having that freedom to think about things in quite different ways when I'm lucky enough to notice and witness those things happening in my own students here at Brunel, which I still frequently do. You know, those moments when the penny drops and everything suddenly becomes open to question. Something that's both scary and destabilizing, but also great at the same time. Now, by the time I graduated, which was in 1990, my interests in anthropology as a discipline, as well as India as the part of the world that I was particularly interested in, I think were well established. And I didn't really know back then about doing PhDs. Um, so I worked for most of the next decade, um, first as a, a journalist on an industrial safety magazine, where I learned to write, um, then as a communications officer for a trade union, um, occasionally, very occasionally, going back to visit the people that I got to know in rural South India, but 
by now I could only go for you know, short holidays. But it was only really in the late 1990s, at a point, I think, when I was disillusioned with what was then still the new Labour government that the union that employed me had helped to elect, or worked to help elect, and I've been involved in, in those campaigns, that my thoughts turned again to studying, to studying anthropology, both a way, I think, of making sense of things that were going on in the world, um, but also because it would give me the opportunity to return to India, which I missed um, for at least a year. It was also, if I'm honest, a slightly drunken decision taken in a bar in Istanbul, but that's, that's another story. Now, my doctoral fieldwork, which I undertook between 1999 to 2000, was a study of what are called people affected by leprosy, which is this preferred term of, of activists, of charities, of NGOs, non-government organizations, who work with people whose lives have been touched by, by leprosy. And I was interested in how people who had been affected by this disease, how they interacted with this label in different ways, at a time when leprosy was set to be eliminated. And while progress towards this millennium elimination target was being celebrated by global health institutions, those living with the disease, as, as well as leprosy doctors and leprosy NGOs that were set to lose the rationale for their very existence, were rather more ambivalent about that prospect. And I mean, this is the, yeah, there's a map there with a big arrow showing you roughly where it was that I was carrying out, out the research. And there was a scene, a scene there from the village. What, they asked, would be the future for people affected by leprosy in a world without leprosy, where leprosy no longer existed? And it was a question that I keep coming back to nearly a quarter of a century after leprosy was officially eliminated, slightly different word, but it was eliminated as a global health problem. And this is despite the fact that around 200,000 people um, still get diagnosed with the disease every year. And in fact, numbers shot up a bit after it was officially eliminated. But that's, that again is another story. And I was also intrigued by the ways in which this seemingly powerless group worked to appropriate and also to redefine dominant ideas, ideas about things like caste, ideas about religion and so on, and how they did that in many ways to their own advantage. So in the same way that a younger me might have shifted my food habits for perceived social advantage, the people that I worked with utilized their negative leprosy status creatively to make claims on the state and on others for resources. And they're also extremely adept at using their leprosy-shaped bodies, whether in begging, and it was much more lucrative um, the more deformities that you could show, um, you know, so it was much more lucrative for the more obviously physically disabled among them, or sometimes in scaring government officials who were not keen on coming into the leprosy colony. Now, social stigma, which is probably the term most associated, I think, with leprosy, was certainly an issue, but it was by no means the only thing that was going on. And looking at people affected by leprosy only as victims of a terrible disease missed out a great deal. So that was that project which took me, or led me to look at disability in a more general sense, and what bodily differences, what having different kinds of bodies meant to people, in particular, social and, and cultural contexts. Um, and I was able to do research on that during a funded three-year postdoc, which was funded by the British Academy, which took me and my family to Hyderabad for 16 months of field work, directly before I came to work here at Brunel in 2007. And then later on, when I was already here, because of the high numbers of younger people, young people in the leprosy colony, where I'd done my initial field work, who had attempted suicide or been involved in self-harm, my interest also turned to how we might understand suicide. Why was it that, by and large, older people affected by leprosy were not attempting suicide when their healthy offspring, in relatively large numbers, were doing so? What did it mean in different cultural contexts to take one's own life? And what did the different methods 
used to tell us about those places and those people. I mean, often the methods that we used were very gendered in different kinds of ways. So my subsequent shift back to food, I sometimes say, responded in part, at least, to the difficulty, um, at least for me, in working on suicide over a sustained period. I needed cheering up, and food ways, at least on the face of it, seemed less obviously depressing as a topic of study. Also, although I hadn't really noticed it at the time, my field notes had always contained a lot of detail about food, something I was clearly very interested in. I had notes on what people, different people ate or did not eat um, and why. I had notes on the order in which people were fed at community feasts and at various life cycle rit rituals. I also had um, notes, quite detailed notes, on everything from the food to the crockery and the seating arrangements of almost every dinner that I'd ever been invited to. And I think I became alerted to the fact that I had this stuff buried there away in my notes um, when I attended a workshop organized by Carolina Seller, which was at SOAS. Um, and I think this was probably before I went off to do my disability field work in Hyderabad. And the, the workshop um, was about, as it was described, the veg versus non-veg divide in Indian cuisine, this, this split that seemed to run through Indian cuisine and in Indian diners as well, between vegetarians and non-vegetarians. Um, and the papers at that, that workshop also looked at the ways in which food might be used both to foster sociality, to bring people together, but also to exclude people. And as I listened to those papers, I realized that I also had material that spoke to the themes that were being discussed there. And in fact, I contributed a paper to the volume that came out of, of that workshop. Now, what people eat in India and how they eat it does index class distinctions, but it also indexes differences in other things. It in indexes differences in religious community, differences in caste status, and differences in gender and generation. And precisely because it's essential, we all have to eat, after all, in order to survive, it's also very politically powerful. And I mean that both in terms of kind of big-scale politics, the kind of rhetoric that you might get from political parties and from governments, but also in relation to the actions of individuals and families, of the potential to make food choices that convey particular meanings or which communicate and sometimes can change identity. Now, to make sense of that, I think you need some, some context. Um, so post-colonial India, which is the country that makes up the largest part of, of, of what pre-1947 was British India, is a majority Hindu country just shy of about 80% of the, popula of the population, of the Indian population, identify as Hindu. It also, at present, has a Hindu nationalist government, called the BJP. Um, and one aspect of being governed by a Hindu nationalist government, and looking at it outward, inwards from the outside, one that perhaps seems the most innocuous, is the enhanced sacred status afforded to the cow. Here's a picture, or a couple of pictures of cows for anybody who doesn't know what one looks like, but this is a particular Indian kind of cow, the zebu, kind of humped back white cow, which is often seen as kind of iconic of India. And it's an animal which is seen as, as being venerated in Hinduism as the nation's mother, um, in part for its provision of dairy products of various kinds, for the provision of dung, which can be used as fuel and, and as fertilizer. Um, and also, they produce oxen um, you know, to pull plows and carts to do work on, on farmland. So it's important materially. The cow plays an important part in everyday life, but it also has particular spiritual significance. And I think it's often one of the key things when you, know, you speak to people who don't necessarily know very much about India or indeed have very much interest in it, that everybody seems to know. That and the fact that lots of Indians are vegetarians. And it's why I think it can sometimes seem quite reasonable when the government, 
for example, announces plans to clamp down on the slaughter, the sale, and the consumption of bovine animals. Or that government provided school meals so that they can be eaten by everyone are compulsorily vegetarian. Sale of beef was also banned at the Commonwealth Games when India hosted them in 2010 without, as far as I can recall, very much protest. Um, and last month, we also saw calls um, on Netflix um, from Hindu nationalists, from Hindu nationalist groups, to remove from its platform a new Tamil movie that depicted a Brahmin chef eating beef and which suggested that the deity Ram might himself have at some time eaten meat. Which, um, which Netflix did pull because it was seen as offending the sensibilities of, of Hindus. Now, in a country where, a cow, where the cow is sacred, it seems quite uncontroversial, right? An example of acceptable cultural difference. It makes sense. You know, why shouldn't things that are widely deemed offensive be banned or removed or controlled in some way? But the context is actually, I think, much more complicated than that. Um, you know, first, it's a misconception that India is largely a country of vegetarians. Um, a majority of the population, between 60%, so around two-thirds, and as high as 88%, depending on which of the figures that you go by, do eat meat, at least when they can access it, some of the time. And despite the taboo that does exist in relation to beef, around 15% of people do eat it. And that's a lot of people in a country the size of India. It's around, well, just well, well over 200 million people. It's about two-thirds of the population of the United States. Now, according to some statistics, I think I put the source there on the slide, consumption of beef actually rose between 2005 and 2012 by 14% in urban areas and by 35% in rural ones. So quite big increases in consumption of beef. It's also the second most consumed meat after chicken. Um, now, some of those who eat it will tell you, as they told me, that they only eat buffalo. And here are some buffalo. Um, a different animal, but are often you know, um, all, all bovines. Um, Others will say that they only eat meat of the cow. But as my research that I did in 2016 and 2017 showed, this was often quite a moot point, um, as the butchers I encountered were generally quite vague about the sources of the beef that they sold. You know, like many people who I might know in the UK who avoid knowing about the horrors of industrial farming so they can continue eating, you know, whether it's cheap chicken or frozen lasagna without feeling guilt, Strategic ignorance played a very useful role here. Now, against this background, political decisions to curb the slaughter of cattle and the actions of vigilante groups, who, as, as some of the people I worked with were very, were very aware of, were happy to enforce those decisions with violence. So these things are not simply a reflection of cultural difference, of benign cultural difference. And certainly those vigilante attacks have become much more common um, in recent decades and in recent years. Now, stricter controls on what people are allowed to eat, certainly meat-eating activists proclaim, so activists kind of on the other side to the vigilantes, has less to do with love of the cow than it does with attacking the communities that are assumed to eat it, which are Dalits, those formerly known as untouchables, and I'll talk a bit more about those in a minute, um, Muslims who make up around 14% of the population. You also have Christians and others. As Aziz, who was one of the butchers that I worked with, not his real name, but as he put it, it's not about meat, it's about Muslims. To be fully Indian in contemporary India, policy implies, and this is what my interlocutors thought, you really need to be Hindu. And this, it's worth pointing out, I think, is a significant shift from the the post-independence vision of India as a secular nation, a nation that's secular not in the sense of excluding religion from public life, like, for example, in France, but in the sense of tolerating and even celebrating religious difference. Controlling what people eat 
on the basis of not offending the majority of the population might still seem relatively benign. And that, I think, is part of the problem because you know, it, it's acceptable to, for, to a global audience for, say, the Indian government to say that it objects to the consumption of beef because the cow is sacred and that this is an aspect of Indian cultural heritage. It's less acceptable, although I think perhaps not as unacceptable as it, as it once was or should be, to say that it objects to Muslims and their practices. So claims to cultural difference in this case might also be a euphemism for anti-Muslim sentiment. And that's certainly what, um, what, what the Muslim butchers and meat sellers I spoke to thought. So, so much for cheering myself up by moving from suicide to food. But there we are. Now, against this background, it makes sense that unlike in the West, where eating meat has traditionally conferred high status, in India, meat has lower status. And here we come back full circle to my original interest in class and social distinction. Um, and vegetarianism is associated with, if not always fully practiced in, in my experience, by Brahmins. And this is a, a you see on the slide, a, a rather crude chart depicting in very simplistic terms, I suppose, the, the Hindu caste system where you have Brahmins at the top, followed by Chatriyas, the, the warrior caste, by Vaishyas, um, the trading caste, and by Shudras at the bottom, um, emanating from different parts of the body of primordial man. Um, and these are the four Varnas, or what are called the, the four Varnas, and the, these split into different caste groups. Now, by contrast, those at the very bottom of the hierarchy, those people listed under that yellow line who don't come within that four Varna system, um, what now tend to be referred to as Dalits, or in government speak, scheduled castes, who used to be called untouchables, eat not only meat, but also in some cases eat beef. And so too do Christians and Muslims, communities that are increasingly othered by the state as not fully Indian. Now, the picture is, of course, complicated by the existence of a cosmopolitan, urban, upper middle, or perhaps upper class in India, which draws its status not so much from the Indian state, but as cosmopolitans, as global citizens, people who might disown vegetarianism as parochial, who might brandish their sophistication in part through their knowledge of other cuisines, so potentially through, through eating meat. Now, in the Indian case, it was not just that eating certain things conferred status, but that status also facilitated the eating of certain things. Now, in my most recent book, which I like to plug at every opportunity, um, if you're traveling to India, it's available there now for 400 rupees, slightly more expensive here, I think about 20 pounds on, on Amazon. But in that book, Sacred Cows and Chicken Manchurian, um, I contrast the dietary habits of, of two men. This isn't all I do in the book, this is, is one part of it. So I contrast the, the dietary habits of two men I knew um, one who I called Prakash, um, and one I called Kotaya, to highlight this. Now, Prakash, first off, was a Dalit, um, somebody from a scheduled caste, from um, a leatherworking caste, living in a lower middle class suburb of Hyderabad. And he'd grown up in a village in a beef eating family. Now, however, he and his wife and children had stopped eating beef. Now, in past part, this was so they didn't risk being chucked out of their rented apartment should their neighbors complain about the smell of it cooking. And this was a very real possibility, and I think it continues to be. Twitter is often full of stories about this, of landlords inspecting tenants' bins for, for meat bones when they suspected they'd been cooking meat in their houses. But it was also because it made it harder if he wasn't eating beef at home, if he wasn't seen eating beef, if he wasn't seen doing things which were associated with his caste it made it much harder for neighbors and for others to identify them as coming from that caste. And he hoped would mean his children were treated with more respect at school, that they could do better, um, and so on and so on. And in the book, I contrast his experience with that of Kotaya, who came from the same village. He came from a Hindu background, but now lived elsewhere in the city with his own wife and children. Now, unlike Prakash, Kotaya came from a politically powerful caste in the state. 
And just to put that into context, many, if perhaps not all, of the previous chief ministers of state in recent decades had come from his caste. Um, it was a caste which did eat meat, but importantly, not beef. And people in the village who I talked to from that caste often also distinguished themselves from those they saw of lower status by the ways in which they prepared the meat that they did serve. Not for them, they told me, the spicy fried preparations preferred by drinking fellows, as they often described them, or people from scheduled castes. They, by contrast, like their chicken curries in a much more subtly spiced gravy. Kotaya, however, now lived away from the village. He had a relatively high-status job in a bank. And although I don't think beef was prepared in his house, which he owned, so I don't think he, you know, he didn't face the same risk of eviction had he done so, but he did boast sometimes of eating it um, in high-end Chinese restaurants and at business-related dinners. So his higher caste and class status than Prakash meant that Kotaya could risk eating beef and even use it to enhance his status in ways that Prakash could not. So you've got here caste, class, and food intersecting in, I think, interesting kinds of ways. Now, in the village, however, and for that matter, in small towns, things were a bit different. So for Prakash, everybody would have known his family's status. Um, so although avoidance of beef in certain situations might have enhanced his status in some ways, at home, living alongside families of the same caste, of the same religion, they were Christians, eating beef became a positive marker of a Christian identity. And so for Christians in that village with strong links or strong bonds to local churches or who work for Christian NGOs, schools, nursing homes, not only was there no need to hide your beef consumption, but you could celebrate it. And in fact, you're expected to celebrate it. You know, indeed, refusal to eat beef in those kinds of circumstances, as I discovered when... Um, as a vegetarian myself, I went to dinner with a beef-eating Christian in 2000, might even cause offence, and I've written about this in, in several places. You know, my host feared that I was taking the side of those that she saw as her oppressors. So, what does all this tell us? I'm coming towards, towards the end now. Um, now, first, I think it pushes us to challenge sacred cows, um, an idiom used in English for well over a century as a metaphor for anything that can't be challenged. You know, and I think if we learn anything from anthropology, it's that our assumptions must always come under scrutiny. In relation to eating meat in India, the empirical knowledge that not everyone avoids it, even beef, helps to challenge the uncritical acceptance of bans on cattle slaughter and even vigilante attacks on those who transport sell or consume beef. It also warns us, I think, to beware the potential dangers of cultural relativism, this thing that anthropologists sometimes promote, and to be alert to claims to how culture and heritage might be mobilized by the powerful for highly partisan political purposes. Who gets to define the culturally acceptable is important to know. Adam Cooper, who was the founder of anthropology at Brunel, has written about how you know, culture has been used as a euphemism for race in relation to apartheid South Africa, for example. What I hope I've also demonstrated is that food, because it's both essential and relatively accessible to all, certainly more so than lots of other status symbols, is remarkably flexible as a, as a carrier of meaning. It can be used both to assert the status quo or to benefit from it and sometimes to challenge it. That's why in contemporary India, eating meat can sometimes be a celebration of Muslim, Dalit or Christian identities and at other times a signifier of cosmopolitan sophistication. Whereas avoiding it, on the other hand, can align you to a Hindu majority just as once in the run-up to independence in the late 1940s, it distinguished you from your colonial oppressors. Now, alongside other things, my work on food continues. But now, or for the moment anyway, it does so more locally with the start of a new project 
um, which we're running under the auspices of our South Asia Studies Research Group. I think I've named that correctly. Um, a, a new project on South Asia in West London, as we're calling it, which aims to reach out to South Asian diasporas around Brunel, which make up, I think, around 30% or more um, of the population of Hillingdon, the borough that we're located in, to carry out ethnographic research with local food businesses and to tease out what local concerns might be in order that we can then try to seek funds to study them. And we've been having conversations with um, a number of people about that. Also with my colleague, Luke Heslop, who's there eating. Um, he's pictured there on the slide. I'm working on a podcast called The Migration Menu, which is attempting to tell the migration stories of South, Ash South, sorry, of South Asian diasporas in West London through food. So watch this space for the launch. We're currently spending a lot of time in South Asian style restaurants, um, eating and talking to the people who run them. As Luke says in the podcast, it's a tough job, but somebody has got to do it. And it's a project that also ties in, in with, if I can be allowed a final plug in closing, um, with the launch of our exciting new master's program in global South Asia studies, which is due to be launched, I think, this September. Um, I'm not going to say more about it here, but if you want to know more about that, do get in touch. My email address, I think, yeah, is up there um, on the slide. But, yeah, so that's where I'm going to, to finish. Thank you very much. So thank you very much, James. That was fantastic. Um, we do have time for some questions. Um, I think it would be very interesting to see if anyone wants to ask questions, um, particularly questions in relation to drunken decisions made in bars in Istanbul. Uh, it's a very particularly academic thing to decide to write a PhD on the basis of that. But uh, yes, there's a question here. We've got a microphone. Wait, wait, two seconds, because we need to have um, the microphone so we can hear. Namaste. I've lived in Bangalore. One of the things to point out is that I remember um, a spiritual teacher who was Hindu um, being asked, what do you do if you go into a, f a family home and they offer you meat? And the answer was quite advanced. If it's given with love, then I will accept it with love because it's the love vibration that's so important. And it's interesting that you haven't brought out in the, the lecture about prashad and the blessing mm. of food, and also how food should be made with good vibrations around it, which is a contrast to sometimes when we're in Western world and we're shouting or we've got the news on with, with negative vibrations as we're cooking and things. But it has to have that high energy uh, vibration to nourish mm. you spiritually as well. Okay, yeah, thank you for that. Um, so are there any other questions? There's one here. Something there. Thanks very much. Hello, James. Hi. Uh, yeah, I just wondered if you um, learn any languages when you're in India? Um, yes. Good. Not particularly well. Telugu. Nobody's going to test me on it, I hope. No. But no. Yeah, yeah. Te Telugu is the local language spoken. Um, we did try to learn Hindi, or uh, Urdu and Hindi, when we were in, in, in Hyderabad, because that was also spoken there. Yes. And tended to speak in a mixture of Telugu, Hindu, Hindi, and, and, and English, which seemed to wait, was the way that lots of the people that I worked with Brilliant. spoke, particularly in the leprosy colony where people had come from all over the country. So often you were communicating in a mixture of, a kind of mis mm. mishmash of all kinds of languages. But yeah, Telugu was the, was the main one. And were your children old enough to pick up? Um, my like youngest that? one, well, sorry, the oldest one, he was three when we were in Hyderabad and he could speak it very well. We got the call, oh, he yeah. went to an English medium school, um, supposedly English medium, and they rang up to apologize for the fact that they caught him speaking Hindi in the playground. He said, no, this would be, would be great. Um, but he would never speak it in front of us. 
except occasionally we'd find out when we were searching for a word for something, he might tell us oh, what it was. Um, but he seemed to forget it all, sadly. Oh. Um, we, we came back when he was about five. Great experience for him. Thank yeah. you very much. Um, actually, uh, we'll bring a mic down. Hello, thank you for the lovely um, journey through your career. Um, could you reflect a little bit back to the UK and how food is being culturally appropriated or inappropriated in the UK and f what that might mean in the context of, for example, the food um, strategy having been pulled and um, the government uh, in particular not being very keen on um, mm. talking about what people should or shouldn't be eating in particular? Mm. Yeah, good question. I'm not sure I know the answer to it, so I might have to think, have a, have, have a think about that one. Um, yeah, in terms of the food strategy, this was the thing that Henry Dimbleby was involved with, wasn't it? That was, yeah, which seemed to be a good thing. I mean, I didn't quite get the reference. You talked also about appropriation of... No. Sorry, you've lost the mic now. <laughs> I guess this is me thinking while I'm talking. Yeah. Um, I guess if you look into the UK, food is being promoted heavily on TV and media and it's kind mm. of an um, imminent topic for everyone. Um, we've got celebrity personalities um, who are involved in food, um, uh, be it people who are promoting drinks, be it be people who are promoting food, and it's all the time there, so we're creating an image constantly about what is appropriate to eat, what mm. isn't appropriate, who should be eating what. Um, the media plays a significant role probably in that, um, but equally it's um, government organizations, um, policy, etc., cetera, mm. etc. Cetera. So what you described happening in India is happening to us here in the mm. UK just as well, and it's quite interesting to reflect what is happening here versus what is happening in India, maybe. Mm. Yeah, and I think that's something that might come out more with this South Asia in West London project. Um, I mean, one of the things that's been raised in relation to Hillingdon with speaking to various councillors and other people that we've met you know, doing library talks was about you know, high incidence of diabetes, for example, and particular kinds of health problems among particular populations which are potentially related to diet and the kinds of food that people have access to um, and so on. So I think that's something that might come up um, in relation to that. But yeah, it's a complex knot of, of things that are going on there. And you do have always that tension between things that official government guidance is telling you is good to eat, but at the same time, things which are promoted through, you know, through advertising and so on, which might stand somehow in contradiction to those things. I don't know if that helps. But so you can just reach behind you. Oh. <laughs> Great, thank you. Very, well, thank you so much, James, for a wonderful talk. Um, Really very personal, um, wide-ranging, informative, thought-provoking. And I really like the, your kind of passionate uh, plea for anthropology as a mm. discipline. I really enjoyed that. Um, one thing you mentioned during the course of your talk, you alluded a little bit to the writing culture debates, the crisis of representation mm. uh, in the early to mid-1980s. Um, and I was wondering a little bit if you could come back to that also, reflect upon that in relation to your own recent work on debates around beef eating or not eating, and the slaughter or non-slaughter of cattle. How do you address the sensitivities, the cultural sensitivities around this topic when writing about it from as a European? Um, and also, how has your book been uh, received among Indian scholars? Yeah, I mean, to answer the last one, I don't know yet. Um, it's being promoted in India quite a lot by the India publisher, because it's just been brought out by HarperCollins in India. And they've had me do various press interviews. So I'm waiting to see what kind of response there will be to that. And in fact, I did one yesterday for an online news agency called The Print, which will come out on YouTube on the 29th of February, I think, um, where, where I'm talking about the book. Um, but they asked me a kind of similar question about where I situated myself in that and the difficulties of doing that. I mean, I think part of it is staying, which is not a very satisfactory answer, but it's about with staying with that tension and being conscious of that that tension all the time. I think another thing that came up in discussing it with this, this, this journalist, who is somebody who lives in India and is writing about these kind of issues and also seemed to feel quite passionately 
about them who, for whom it's quite difficult to say some of those things, whereas for me it's much easier. I don't need to be as brave in the way that lots of journalists are being in India um, when the press is really being curtailed um, at the moment. Um, and there's all kinds of stuff going on, and I'm kind of you know, quite amazed, actually, at the bravery of the people who are still carrying on publishing quite critical kind of stuff. But, so in a way, I felt a, a sort of sense of obligation without trying to be too grandiose about it as somebody who can step away and therefore write about those things that were important to the people I worked with but who felt that they couldn't necessarily say them. Um, thank you for your presentation. Um, I've got a question, but I just say a couple of things so you know the context. And, uh, you know, um, there's something there, and when you look at it, different people see different things. An example is if I have an infrared camera and take a picture of this room, that picture would be different from if I have a visible light camera. Uh, all right, so there is that difference. And the other difference is that when one is kind of going, moving into a different culture, a lot of precepts and simple and colloquial term baggages one has because, uh, and so then one is looking at something else with a lot of things that are actually from a different system. So with all of that, so my question is here, so when one is looking into, then how does one get to validate? Is that what conclusions or summaries that are coming out, they are actually the real thing, rather than it's a kind of uh, particular to do with, oh, that was the infrared camera, that's what I saw, mm. or that was a visible light camera, that's what I saw. So one thing is to see, Another thing to validate. So, how does one validate the conclusions? Um, I mean, I think what I'd say in relation to that is that there isn't one single truth that I'm trying to reveal. What I'm trying to show are different perspectives, and I think which is what most anthropologists are trying to do with their research, and not trying to find an ultimate truth in a situation, but to explain the perspectives of the particular people that they work with. So for me, that was about making, un understanding why the things which people did made sense to them, not that those things were objective, ob objectively true or objectively, objectively verifiable or not, if that makes sense. Um, and uh, yeah, and also, also being aware, I mean, in terms of my own work and coming to conclusions and bringing stuff together, I mean, necessarily it's always going to be, going to be selective and you go down one line of particular focus. But I think, yeah, in doing that, it's about being alert to as many perspectives as possible. I don't know if that answers your question or not. It does, but there's a lot of relativism, relativism in it. Mm. And yeah. so as, as somebody who is looking into what somebody else have done, mm. how does one then take that? Meaning, you know, that they... It, yeah, I mean, there is no absolute... I, I can never climb into yeah. somebody else's head and work out exactly why they thought a particular thing, but I can you know, say back my interpretation and see whether it makes sense, okay. sense, Thank you. sense to them or not. But, Thank you. Yeah. One more question. Just over here. Oh, no. Was that... Did you have your hand up as well? Yeah. Well, no, we'll have this question and then we'll have that one as the last one, if that's okay. Hi, Professor. Uh, Hi. So, um, I just got remem uh, remembered about um, anthropologists who, uh, while I was reading, uh, be uh, basically I'm from Tamil Nadu. So, uh, there was an anthropologist called Topa, Topa Armasimum, if you had heard about him. So, um, uh, I got to know about one thing, uh, like uh, usually South Indians eat rice. So, um, the people who are working in, uh, uh, mostly the working class people and Dalit people who are working in the rice fields, so the land, landlords uh, used to give them about uh, two to three weeks of rice if they work for two months. Mm -hmm. So in order to, um, you know, uh, comfort their hunger, they used to uh, put salt in the rice while it's boiling. Mm -hmm. So if, even if we eat a little, 
uh, amount of rice, your hunger sets in. Mm. So uh, it's like uh, the culture evolved with them, putting uh, salt in the rice. Yeah. So I wanted to introduce about Topa, and uh, also there is an uh, uh, anthropologist from uh, Pondicherry who is called J. Sela Stephen. Um, Usually it was a French colony and yeah. he has written many books from the French archives. So I just wanted to let you know. Okay, thank you thank very you. much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, hi, James. Uh, it's a very wonderful lecture. Um, me being a Hindu from Sri Lanka, and I'm a Sri Lankan Tamil, and I understand the taboo of eating beef, but I would like to know your thoughts regarding vegan market comparing UK and India. So for an example, if a market introduced vegan beef, it's it could be a quiet success in UK market. What would be the case in India if a person who would like to eat a vegan or a plant-based meat what will be their self-identity and how will be the society will look into them and how it will be challenged or cha change their status? Yeah, that's, that's a really interesting question and one I've never thought of at all before. Actually. Um, it's always the last one. Yeah, um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I've never seen, I've never seen any instances of, of vegan meat, which I'm sure are probably available in, in urban areas in India, but I've, ne I've never seen them and I've never been offered them or never seen anybody um, try to cook with them. I mean, the thing that the people I worked with wanted to celebrate was this idea that you had something that was meat that was special, and whether it would still have that same specialness about it, vegan meat. Um, and I try and feed my son vegan meat, and he's not very happy about it when I do. So, um, so I'm not sure that it would go down that well, although actually it might lend itself quite well to it, because the flavor often comes from, from other things. So if you had something that was, that, that was chewy and gave you that bite, which is often what people are looking for, in, in, in which you don't get um, you know, in, in lentils in a vegetarian diet in India. But that's certainly a question we should talk about this more in, in future, because that's something I think that we should probably look at in our, our project as well. Thank oh, you. One last question, just at the back. Thank you, James. That was a really um, interesting lecture. So I am a British-born Hindu woman, and <clears throat> your lecture ignited several stories for me of living in the extended family with my grandmother, my dadima, and I used to sleep in the same bedroom as her. Now, she was a vegetarian, and the rest of my family ate meat. So every night she would tell me stories, and she educated me on the spiritual side of not eating meat. So I became vegetarian at the age of eight because she would educate me on the chakras and say eating meat as a woman would ignite grod, anger in you as a woman. So it wasn't good, it wasn't healthy to eat meat. And also what the woman over there um, raised about the prashad as well, mm. the sacred food that's made on auspicious occasions, and that notion of love and vibrations as well. So it made me think about that, and also in my own doctoral research as well, um, it made me think about young girls who talked about menstruation and the purity of food as well, particularly when touching foods like pickle and how they'd become polluted. And so they did raise some points on that as well. So, and the vegan point, that very interesting question that's just been raised, my mother-in-law is vegetarian, and when I've offered her vegan substitutes, she's often s seen that as still not appropriate, because it's almost like you're feeding the brain meat, mm. you're psychologically trying to trick the brain with a vegan substitute. So it's kind of raised for me... Um, things related to my upbringing um, and some of the research my daughter's done into grandmother's narratives of food across the UK and Indian food and it's really made me think about the spiritual side as well and I just wondered if the spirituality or the, the gendered side a bit more in relation to women, menstruation, also rituals post-birth 
on how you enter a kitchen for 40 days or you don't. So there's a lot of other rituals as well. So thank you. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, there were lots of notes about all of those things, um, I think, that I had, particularly in relation to menstruation and sometimes in relation to how women, certainly in the community where I worked, where they were mostly converted Christians, so they had a slightly different kind of relationship to those, some of those spiritual things that you're talking about, but would, would threaten to cook for their husbands when they were menstruating and their husbands not being sure. So, and, and then lots of fears about you know, people burning their, their menstrual cloth and putting it into their husband's curry and this kind of thing. So it was certainly used in, I mean, this is not a very spiritual usage, but in a usage that, that, that was empowering in some ways um, to women. It's also interesting about, I mean, that distinction between what's vegetarian and non-vegetarian. That You know, often there are debates you know, about whether mushrooms are truly vegetarian. They're not eaten, I know, by some groups. Um, and, you know, you have the things with onions and garlic and things not being eaten by Jains because they inflame those passions in the same way that you, you were talking about. So, yeah, but, yeah, thank you for that. That was so, very useful. Um, I just want to say one final thank you for James. James will be out here. So if anyone has any other questions to ask him, do please grab him afterwards while we're all eating. But I just want to say thank you, James, for an absolutely fantastic lecture. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Thank you.